Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Boha. Uh, this week on the panel, we're going to be talking about weapons. Uh, it's a very important subject. It's something everyone really wants to get straight into as soon as they get into the sport. But there's a lot of options out there. And it can be very complicated. So this week we have with us, uh, we have Anthony Lansdale. Hey. Uh, Steph Kittle. And Piers Hello. Gore. Hello. So obviously there's a lot to cover here few different bits and pieces so let's get straight into it and let's talk some bow hurt so the first weapon that the first thing that everybody does when they get into the sport the first question you always get asked is where can i buy a sword everyone wants to buy a sword but the brutal truth that no one wants to hear is you don't need a sword yet first time you're going to need a steel sword it's probably when you start going to competitions and as you can tell from the photo there we tend to have a few spares so training weapons are the first things you get. So what do you guys use for your uh, go-to training weapons? Well, there's two sides to that. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, you have soft weapon for soft training, which would be for sparring. And the second thing would be a training weapon for Pell or technique training. Um, in my personal opinion, um, soft weapons are readily available from multiple sources. Uh, they've developed quite a lot with the advent of the soft sport for just adults and children. You can, they're all fundamentally the same and, and I would say relatively in a, in a, inexpensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the flip side for Pell training, a solid stick will do the trick to start with or yeah. um, spend about 60 quid on Amazon for a cold steel waster. I've used those before. I'm not a massive fan of some of them. Um, because they can't I, shatter. I tend to find all false pieces. Mm. The, uh, mm. the most, this top, uh, from price to effectiveness, the most effective piece of kit I've ever used or found is either a sledgehammer handle with, with the sledgehammer head cut off, gives your portable handle useful some instances, and a light pell stick with grip on it, and it's fiber brass and lasts a long time. And the second one, and my personal favourite, is a matchup handle, which you can get for a tenner off of Amazon. And it's just a very large piece of wood, small handle at the end, thicker end at the top to stop the matchup head or the pickaxe head falling off the end. If it's too heavy for you, just start chopping chunks down a bit until it gets to the right length, the right weight. Um, you've got a lot of wood there to play with. I've yet to have any of them break ever. That is the long and the short of it. And um, with training weapons, don't be fooled into thinking you can just make your own soft sword and get away with it because we've all tried to do we've all tried to save money and take a bit of plastic tubing and put some pipe legging around it it's it doesn't last yeah so, not, not even five seconds with the soft swords you make yourself um i went through a phase of making soft swords for yeah. my local club and i must have spent a ridiculous amount of money when i could have just like forked out for something that lasted and then that would have lasted the yeah, it's, it's the false economy theory in play there, but everyone thinks they're a bit of a mastermind and like, 20 quid for a sword? Pfft, I'll make five for that. You watch. But yeah, now moving on to uh, actual weapons. Um, I've, I've got some images here. Most of them are from uh, Medieval Extreme or Boat Tech and a couple from Joe Dawes. Uh, we'll have links in the description after this. But uh, first one to talk about is, as you can see there, the, the arming sword. Uh, I... Talking about Boha in particular, I don't think these really have a place, but uh, just to get them out there as to why they're not particularly useful. They are a dueling weapon, but you guys have had any experience with those in the list for or against? Yeah, I mean, um, I started off um, with arm and swords, um, you know, from a female point of view, and everything's a lot more um, <clears throat> smaller scale than the men's side for Boha. We started 3v3. And um, I'm going to say it, we weren't that technically proficient at all. So armor sword, just so we could, it's nice and lightweight. Yeah. So you can keep holding it up and you can keep hitting, but it doesn't do a thing. Not a damn thing. So it, like from that point of view, you're just holding the weapon for the sake of holding a weapon. You're not going to end up using it to do anything. Yeah. So. so. No, they don't have a thing. Back in the early days, when we first started doing steel on steel training or armoured training, we used steel in that, which at the time was a bloody mistake, but we learned that pretty quickly in hacks and um, pell sticks, the best thing to use with basic armour training. But we were using arming swords, bad falchions, bloody all sorts, which, as you say, wonderful to get the big bring in the desk. It's wonderful to get the beginning of a swing behind you, but it does nothing. 
Mm-hmm. No, they're um, they are built just for maneuverability and where the balance is, just to have a mobile tip. And um, if we go to the exact opposite end of that spectrum, we move on to actual falchions. Um, very different physics behind these. You don't want to duel with them, but these are the bread and butter of a bowhurt fighter, in my opinion. A couple of different kinds, um, but fashions in general. Uh, these are what you need to be using, essentially, I believe. Uh, you guys have any other different opinions about them? There is a use for a one-handed axe kicking about. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think, as bread and butter, as you say, that fashions is the way forward. There's such yeah. a variety in weights and shapes and weight distributions, more importantly for fashions, that any one of any skills that can pick those up or any strength and use that to build themselves to either the next stage or become comfortable and proficient with what they've got in front of them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what you're saying about shaping, I think there are two broad categories of falchions here. So um, if you look at one, three, and four here compared to two and five, they're the, the flat edged, I'd call them. Uh, I think they're, they're better because you've got a broader uh, area to get your impact on as opposed to two and five and more pronounced on this one, like a, a beaked or a thorned falchion. Yeah. That gives you a bit more of the axe effect where you're trying to get into gaps. But I think they used to be more popular than they are. And we, now we've transferred more into everyone's got a, um, a flat edged sort of falchion. Yeah, the flat headed falchions tend to be slightly longer, which gives mm-hmm. you a greater angle of moment and just more force yeah. on landing. Um, I, I mean, a short since the minimum length of falchions changed as well, uh, a surprising number of thorny falchions were actually very short and yeah. weighted quite... Uh, I, I mean, we remember when they all pretty much were not usable mm. um, <laughs> just by a centimetre or two. That shape with the, uh, the beak at the end almost became the archetypal HMB falchion. Yeah. It was almost universally recognised. It became part of club logos, national logos, and I think the French Federation Bower has caught the um, fighter with one of those falchions as part of the image. Hmm. Yeah, yeah it, was, it became universally recognized. In about 2014, but, 2015, they were very popular. Yeah, but they're beginning to be phased out, I think, for um, better pieces of equipment. Well, most yeah. of them aren't authentic enough because no, they're, they're yeah. a misshape of a different type of falchion. This yeah. was what I was about to um, ask for the authenticity side. Um, I thought a lot of these falchions, like historically, they had the lumps and bumps on them. They were on the back of the weapon, I thought, with a, a smoother cutting edge hmm. on the front. So, so my understanding of what this falchion actually is supposed to be, um, there is a falchion which starts off relatively thin hmm. and then beaks out at the front and has a flat head. So it's not it's not like a, a big old nipple. It's actually yeah. um, a wedge. Um, hmm. And I think it might be derived from that, or it may be another one of those broken head broken tip yeah, falchions. Yeah, a broken tip where it looks like it's bored at the top like this when it actually, and they've taken that to me, oh, look, you exaggerate that, give us the beak, get those gaps. Mm. But... Yeah. But, um, I think with the uh, the nipple on it, you start to get into the realms of you've only got one point of contact and it can ruin your edge alignment if you're not perfect on it, a bit like the effect yeah. you have with axes. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I'll move on and I'll show you this is one of mine. And it sparks up some conversation sometimes because of the the size of it, essentially. Mm. Um, Some people like lighter weapons. I've got, this is like max weight, max length. And I like it. That's the way. So I've got it for twin Saturn. But yeah, no, it's one of my favorite bits of kit. I've played around with different thousands of different weights and different lengths. But actually, Mm. when you're training with this properly, the reach that's the main thing for me. I can outreach people with pole arms with that particular bit of kit. Yeah, I've, I've seen some Brilliant. very surprised eyes looking back at me from uh, how it is when I start hitting their hands. Yeah. If you realise they're out of range, but you're in. So. <laughs> but um, yeah. as uh, we were talking before this, Anthony, you're like, you're the opinion that a, a heavier weapon reduces your ability to strike as quickly. Yeah, so when you have uh, more weight, it reduces your ability to launch the weapon as effectively. Now, mm-hmm. if you're a, if you're an elite athlete, you've trained for the top end weapon anyway, so it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but when you're new and you just don't you don't have that muscular impulse and you can't mm-hmm. launch off, you might want to lean on the acceleration side yeah, as opposed yeah. to the mass <clears throat> side. 
So yeah. you want to land with as much force as possible. Yeah, this is this yeah. is very true. Like you've got to train to use a weapon like that. Like I yeah. I use that weapon, but then a lot of new guys that in my team stuff start getting big fashion. I was like, you, you don't want to be using that. You're, you won't be able well, you to. just you just train bad technique. Because if you're using a tool, like um, let, let's say you're doing overhead press and you yeah. decide to start with a weight you can barely lift, you are going to learn overhead press with a lot of compensation, mm -hmm. um, bad torso shape, and you'd be better off starting light, learning the physical process of the yeah, lift, yeah. and then progressing. The same goes for striking with a sword. Yeah, so I think absolutely. it's the same argument for armor is for weapons, which is you don't learn to drive in a Ferrari. You learn to drive in a clapped out old banger, and then once you've totaled that, you'll get a nicer car. And it's the same thing for weapons. Like, you don't want to spend 300 quid on a brand to make a new Belgian when you get into the sport. Get something mid grade, like run of the mill, learn, see how you fight, see what's better for you, and then go from there. But if you walk in by high end kit, like Joe, anything Joe Gord makes, we are spoiled in this country because of that man. Um, but if you walk in by something like that, then don't expect to be rolling off the punches and the blows like Dan and Ed on the first five seconds. It takes years to train that. And if you jump, as Anthony quite rightly says, straight into the big, like the bigger weights, bigger lengths, then the chances are you're going to be training bad technique and do more harm to yourself over extension, tennis elbow, joint okay. pains, especially the shoulder of the work. It's not good for you. Or hitting your teammate is a classic. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get we'll get onto pole arms later. Oh no, I I just meant in general because <laughs> I'm I'm assuming new guys won't know to do back swings anyway. Mm. But if you swing and you can't control the blade, either you're gonna let go of the weapon or your wrist is gonna carry and you're gonna hit something over there. Uh, yeah. Worst case scenario, you hit back of the knee of an opposition member and you screw yeah. the team over you because you over swing, miss, and just wrench everything out on the way back. That, that's true. So this yeah. is all another reason why I, why I said at the beginning, uh, a sword isn't the first thing you need to buy. You need to fettle and fiddle with loads of other people's. And I always say it's a bit of a nerdy quote, but the one chooses the wizard. You know, you can mm. look at swords all day long. And if you go, I like the look at that one, I'm going to use that one. I'm going to look so cool. And then you pick it up and go, I don't like it. But you will pick up a weapon and go, oh, I like that. I, I have a little test where I kind of centrifuge yeah. past my ear. And if I hear a good whoosh, I'm happy with it. Yeah, I mean, also different senses of balance work for different people, just due to yeah. differences in arm length, hinge positioning, body composition as well is a factor. Yeah. So if your shoulder comes out an extra couple of inches more than somebody else's, you will prefer a different weight balance just because well, of how the mechanics a, work. I think it's a really good point to bring Steph in there, actually. I was like, how have you found, Steph, that like, unlike the lads might wander around with all these you know, compensation bits of toys, but how have you found for you and the lasses, what works better for your body mechanics? How does that sit and why? I mean, I, I would consider myself as a, you know, quite, quite a sort of like average size strengthy girl. Um, and my first falchion, which is actually I've got it up there. Um, I've got this Battle of the Nations 2016. Um, and it is 1.7 kilo. Um, unfortunately, it's too short to, for regulations now. But um, I loved this thing, absolutely loved it. But actually, um, for my first Battle of Nations, and that was actually my first international fights, way too heavy, way too heavy. Um, what I've got now is something more, it's a 1.5-ish, Joe Dawes, but I know what I'm doing now. Um, but yeah, again, weight balance, it's going to be a lot different from what you guys are used to. But it, I just, it feels like an extension to my arm, which is what you want when you get to that mm. level, when you know what you're doing, you want it to feel like this is part of you and you know everything. And like, I'm, I'm not scared that I'm going to drop it just out of like, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? So I've got a bit of baby brain, so I forget words. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, just out, out of tiredness or anything like that. Um, but yeah, not you don't need to go for anything flashy. Um, what you do need to do, ideally, is have a play around with different shapes, different weights, mm -hmm. and like Barney was saying, like give it give it a good like whip around, like see how it feels in your hand, and if it feels, you you'll know if it feels right. Essentially, I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> 
So Sorry. we'll move on from there onto uh, one-handed axes. Uh, some people use them quite well. I'm not a massive fan of them. I think the uh, biggest reasoning for them is I've heard that I can't argue against really is uh, if you've got shoulder shoulder injuries or elbows, anything like that, they can be a lot easier to use in that respect. But um, I've never really used one. I've always preferred a falchion. What about you guys? Any experiences with or against them? Uh, I've used I... them. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, please. Fair enough. I've used them occasionally and sporadically throughout the time I've been doing sport. Um, detraction is there's no balance. The, mm. There's no counterweight on these axes. It's all lump, It's all business at one end. Um, so that that can be the problem. The upside is if you've got a really well weighted one and it's long as well, the momentum, the power, the swing you can get behind them, mm. they can do a lot of damage and they've got a much narrower face. So that's a bonus and a like a negative and a bonus. So the negative it's a lot easier to hit with the hat than it is with the blade if people are moving around and if you're not well trained with what you're doing. Um, whereas the counter is when you do hit them with that narrow blade, that narrow blade is you can easily, well, it's mm. easier to get one of those into a gap in somebody's armor than it is, say, the entire blade of a falchion. Mm. So they're good, they're useful. I keep a short one on my belt just in case my falchion ever failed, snapped, or fell out of my hand, whatever got taken reason. And they've got use in that regard. But I know some people do use shorter, stockier, stouter versions as a one-handed just to get in there to brawl and lay it and lamber them. But for me, a good belt weapon. Yeah, I, I feel very similarly there. Um, uh, another reason is a lot of the armourers advertise them a lot more than anything else and they're cheaper to produce, probably a better profit margin. They are cheap. They're cheaper to get hold yeah. of and I, that's why a lot of people start with them. Uh, <laughs> they are expertise weapons though mm. so w with a falchion um, you have to control the strike alignment mm. and then you've got the whole length of the blade to land with obviously you don't want to land down near where either the ricosso would be or down near the cross guard that's mm. a waste of time but you do have a striking edge length that's quite long yeah. with this you might have 10 centimeters and those 10 centimeters, if you misalign that, and, and also uh, to add an extra consideration, your misalignment, if you misalign a falchion blade, you're talking about tilting it just like a tiny bit. If you misalign an axe head, your deviation's huge. Mm. Um, like now, twist in your hand. Yes. Um, and I mean, also, you don't have a cross guard, which will usually kind of sit nicely in a gauntlet to keep it aligned in your hand. I have seen mm. people hit with the back of back of axes repeatedly. Mm -hmm. I've only fought against one or two people that I think are good with one-handed axes. Um, you can find one of them in Bayard, mm -hmm. uh, and that that is a that is a very mean axe. It is the longest half die on a one-handed axe I have ever seen, with a small head, and it's exactly it's pr it's perfectly designed for hitting flesh, biting into a gap and having as much carrying weight as possible. Of course, that's a legitimate way of using the weapon. Um, now, there are some advantages to axes which you don't have with swords. Mm -hmm. yeah. For example, you can use the haft as a grappling element. And I don't mean suicide throws. That's not what I'm talking about before anyone jumps on me for no, no, you advocating can, that. You can half grip. Uh, yeah. Well, even if you just have a, a this much distance there, mm -hmm. You can, that's enough to control a shoulder yeah. very well. Um, and it just gives you that little extra bit of leverage that you can use in a grapple to reposition people, which you don't get with the sword. But once again, that's an expertise thing. You need to be better trained to even that, take advantage of that. That does bite both ways, though, because you can grab non combat parts of an opponent's weapon as well. Yes, you can. So I've had it before someone's in a grapple, you've got their axe, and you just go. <laughs> You can twist it. Like I say, cut both ways. But Absolutely. It's, like I say, I think it's deceptive in how good you've got to be with it. Um, because where they're cheaper, easy to get hold of and produce. Yeah. I'd, I'd say the correct term would be that they have a higher skill ceiling. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the ability to use them by default is very difficult, which is why they're regarded as less effective. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think um, Ukolov described it very well in that uh, sword is a good general purpose weapon, uh, which is good for striking flat surfaces of armor and gaps, mm. whereas an axe is for biting into gaps exclusively and striking armor because of how axe heads deflect off of rounded, well-rounded surfaces is mm. 
very pointless. I mean, if you have an axe and you find the the brig fastening gap or you find a hip gap, you're going to have a great time. Uh, or if they've only got half half legs uh, and they don't have any um, back of the leg protection, you will also have a great time. But it, it is circumstantial, very, um, and you need to train with it and be good. There's one thing that is a bit controversial with axes for me is the the advent of the the hammer axes that came up for a while. I was not a fan of those existing. I can't comment on this issue. <laughs> I've got one stuff in my garage. All right, yeah. you've got a lot <laughs> in your garage, mate. That ain't allowed. I have. Yeah, those war clubs. Yeah. I'm glad they didn't see the light of day. Yeah, uh, the gun and die. Moving along the same vein of the. Uh, Half did one handed weapons. We got maces, yeah, good old bow at lollipop. So my opinion on maces is they have every disadvantage the axe has and more without mm. any of the advantages. No, I agree. So, uh, it does have I an advantage over the axe. Like, uh, maces broken on me and it didn't dent me at all. Mm. Yeah. The, the, the only advantage to an axe to this over an axe is that you've got like one of six choices for blade alignment <laughs> as opposed to one. It, 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 it's basically, I want to use an ax, but I am la lack any skill. But you can be very lazy with them. Hmm. So this is kind of like, if you don't want to learn how to use a weapon, use a mace. <laughs> um, when you're talking about uh, skill ceilings earlier, I think with a mace, you can pick it up and get a, a relatively high amount of power out compared to your first time with a Faust or an ax. But it levels off very quickly. You can't train to strike much harder with a mace than when you first pick it up. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. a bit of a noob crutch. So you can pick it up and go, wow, I'm hitting really hard with this. I can't hit with a falchion, so I'm going to use this. But Whereas the, you put a bit of time in and you soon... The, the big problem with maces, and this is a very real issue, is they are incredibly dangerous. And because they are incredibly dangerous, they've been yeah. nerfed so hard in the rules that they're useless. Because if they weren't useless, they would be really hurting people. That's yeah. a really good point. Maces are designed to cripple people inside armor whilst leaving the armor relatively intact. So historically, you can take people prisoner and ransom them. You break their knees, you break their elbow, you take them home, sell them back to their family. Well, we don't want to be breaking people's arms, legs and elbows in this sport directly. So to make sure you can't do that, they've dropped the weight limits on these things. They used to be made out of solid brass, solid iron, solid bronze, sorry. Um, whereas, as you can see from the maces you have here, they're all much thinner, much more delicate, a tube with flanges welded on. Um, but their effect against armor, because as Anthony says, they've been nerfed to the nth degree to ensure they don't cripple people inside their armor. Mm. It just broadly like, it renders them useless. The, the maximum weight is one kilo, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Which is abysmally low, considering the the ceiling of weight for axes is three point two. Is that right? Yeah, for, for two handed. Two -handed so one, yeah. Handed, one handed could be one point three. Yeah, and the, the same thing with one handed axes, which is why the long half small head is actually probably the most optimal one handed axe design. Uh, oh, because one handed axe used to be maximum length, small Joe Dawes head, like a small little beak yeah. on it. Because mm. once again, you want that acceleration yeah. and that and end force. Yeah, yeah, uh, but maces have no real place uh, in the sport that much. Ball-headed maces, when they do appear, can be all right, but they tend to be really stubby. Um, I mean, I'm going to be honest. A mace is a boxer's weapon in this sport. If you want to yeah. punch people, take a mace. Don't use a sword, and mm. just go around having fun, I guess. But I... it's not for practical medieval fighting in this sport specifically. The only use I have for it, as Pierce said with the axe, is it goes in my belt. Because it's oh, got weapon. no corners or edges, it just sits in like my, my hip gap in the mm. fold, essentially. It doesn't get in the way. And if I lose my weapon, I can just put my hand on it and start swinging while I run to get it, a real weapon. It, it is funny yeah. that you mention that. I, I, was, I once had one. I'd won one at a tournament, and um, it's now a paperweight because it snapped off the top, and I haven't bothered to repair it. Um, but I had it at a, at a tournament here, and I was tired, and I, I I didn't have a belt loop, so I just held it under my shield hand, yeah. just so that it was there in ca just in case. And they're so light, you can just carry it in your off hand without actually inhibiting yourself at all. Yeah, I think my spell six hundred grams is is nothing. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah, Barney's that. point has a spare weapon there, especially when you're not allowed to perform any form of aggressive action without a weapon in your hand. Mm -hmm. If for whatever reason your primary is gone or is no longer, a, this one is caught, it's broken, it's on the floor somewhere. Having something like that or an axe in your belt, it serves a purpose. But 
get well, added to the Talking universe. about secondaries, did any of you guys fight during the times of shield swords? No. Okay. Um, this might be a um, Joe Dawesism. Um, <laughs> very reenactory to me though, because when I used to do the Norman stuff, we used to keep a long dagger in the kite shield behind our rim. Yeah. Like, it would be held in by our arms. So if the sword or the spear were holding, it fell back yeah. as well. There, there was a time where uh, certain Eastern fighters used to have uh, the Eastern short falchions just in their shield. Usually if they were using a shield in two-hander or something similar, and then they would just pull it out of there instead of having it on their belt. Which yeah. so it does, just reminded me of that. But I haven't seen that in about four years. I think that's extinct, thank God. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. So, yeah, that's... Uh... Pretty much the majority of the one-handed weapons that you'll see in the list that we've gone through. And uh, let's move on to the, the bigger boys. So in two-handed weapons, there's short axes, we'll call them, the hand-and-a-half axes. Probably the most popular sort of thing you'll see in the fives and smaller fights. Yeah, uh, they height, basically. They get very, people very excited for these. I don't know how to use one. <laughs> but uh, they're a fearful weapon for sure. And they yeah, do you... have their place. No. It is. So it, it's again, it's the seeding of skill here. So if you're good with one of these, you are bloody good with one of these mm. and to be feared. Whereas if you crap, then you're a hindrance to your team. Mm. Yeah. Because you've got, a, you've, got, you've got no way of defending yourself with one of those weapons. It's your bare hand wrapped around a large piece of wood. And if you like, to, if people are against you, like the hit hand, and various members of various teams on part of do, um, <laughs> you, you constantly put yourself at a disadvantage. And as we spoke about earlier with the long falchion, actually your range with that long full length falchion is greater than the range they've got with this axe. So that disadvantage that you could definitely hit heavier with one of those axes when you're genuinely good with one of them. Hmm. Um, and they again I do become something to be feared. The French walk in with those fire axes for the 1910s, which will eventually be wiped out by authenticity, but for the moment they love. Um, like, short little buggers um, just below middle height and then you just walk in shield strap to this one the small round one and just hack away um, but their hands are vulnerable and most of them wear scaled mitts and yeah, I, but... I don't say um, sorry just to interject um, certainly on, on the female side there aren't too many really well weathered proficient two-handed axe users in the female side so if you come in with an axe like this you are going to be a target mm. yeah 100%. I've, seen, I've seen i've seen one i've seen one in the one us lady who is very proficient and and very good with them and I, that's about yeah yeah she's really good but yeah I, I i dare say she's probably possibly one of the only ones that i've seen yeah, yeah for sure um and I think the, the other downfall of these, again, speaking from um, female perspective, is it opens you up to a lot of dodgy moves, um, like you were commenting earlier, suicide takedowns, yeah. which isn't ideal because you haven't really helped your team, generally speaking, um, and you don't really want to do a suicide takedown anyway. Um, but there's, there's also things like... Um, if, if you get the shot behind someone and and you hook it under the helmet, like it's easy for that shaft to hook under the mm. helmet and then start pulling up the helmet and that's dodgy. And uh, It could be argued to be controlling the edge if yeah. you are not careful. Or choking if, if yeah, you push so too hard. There's several things there that the marshals will stop people doing and they have to change the grips. You know, I'd go to the neck, you have to go one hand over the top and one hand under so it goes against the chest. Mm. But yeah. you're right, and I think everyone here has seen at least one battle of a nation where some people using short axes have been doing things they should not have been doing with them. I have some quite practical experience of that. Um, in my first battle of the nations, a gentleman hooked a two-handed axe but under the base of the back of my helmet, so uh, across the back of the neck, and just did a full-body backflop. So he was doing a suicide throw, but bracing his entire body weight across a half on the back of my neck and I, I mean like it had gone under the aventail and was just sitting on my spine um, which wasn't terribly comfortable uh, the, the long and the short with pole arms is you're either absolutely amazing or absolutely useless with them, there's not much in between you've got to specifically train yeah. for it 
And what? if you haven't trained very well, hard. you're a liability to everyone. There's mm. a second skill set as well, which which is often not available to new fighters, which is footwork, positioning, trips, center field throws, and the whole list yeah. of, of advanced skills that most people so don't have. This is it. So the best axe fighters, I, or axe best fighters I know with a short two-handed axe are the best, because, not just because they can swim the thing and hit like a truck, although they can, it's because they can trip, throw, grapple, and run their fast. They're quick on their feet. They're the smaller guys. They are sinew. They are agile. They don't sit down to brawl and fight one-on-one. They bounce, like hit, bounce, next person, hit, bounce. They're finding anything to take advantage of on the list. Someone's turned the wrong direction. Right, shot into somewhere soft, maybe try to throw them. Run. Someone's running at you. Use their weight against them, trip them, throw them. Next. They don't stick about. They do not have long, protracted fights. And if they do, they do not do well in them. Like sword and board, you catch the first strike on your shield. That was fun. My turn. Move in closer. Start hacking at things that want to be hacked at. Even the hacker, the weapon itself can be a liability. If the wood isn't treated properly, I know you've got Tim on soon, and he'll go through this properly with you, but if that isn't decent, Tim, if it isn't well treated and well looked after, your weapon could break mid-fight. Hmm. Run back to the list. Like your that's end a, of the that's list. a threat of all of the whole arms as well, like the one-handers mm-hmm. as well. But um, a, a slight subtype of the two-hand, this is the one and a half, and then there's the big boys, the proper halberds. Yeah. Um, not so useful in the smaller fights, I'd argue, but um, you get into your 12s, your 30s, your anything bigger that than ranks, that. They definitely have a place. <laughs> it's, um, it's quite an inspiring sight as your weapons come up and you look at the line of fighters in front of you and you just see all the big yeah, weapons come up ready to ruin yeah. your day. And you're like, oh. <laughs> even, even these are quite interesting because you can have a fighter that is not experienced but can drop a stick on someone mm. and it will still have an effect. Now, obviously... <laughs> that's not really the skill level you want, especially at the kind of events where you have 30 v 30, Mm. um, because Battle of Nations level shouldn't be dropping a stick on someone. Uh, But they are actually fundamentally incredibly simple to use because, well, I mean, they're designed to be used by anyone and everyone. um, And it is just dropping a weight on the end of a stick. Yeah. Yeah. And the place of those sticks tend to come down is either the center of the skull, and if you've got a bad helmet, or the gaps around the shoulders and the arms or the hand. Uh, my personal primary target when I used one briefly was um, the side of the knee. So uh, if the halberd head lands... Really unpleasant. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about a solid side of knee strike against the angle of the knee. I'm talking about a vertical strike that you drops in between... Battles. Right. Yeah, that drops in between the leaf and the cues. Um, because that if there is an armor weakness, that That'll that worry. that yeah, you'll have an armor failure is caused immediately because rivets will go anything else and it's a valid strike. Um the chance of uh accidental injury is also very low because it's going in line with the leg as opposed to against the joint of the leg. That's yeah, that's what right. I meant. Well, I'm not talking, talking about, about smashing the side. No, absolutely not. I'm not I'm not that kind of person. Um okay. So again, it's something that Tim can go into far more detail in, but the shorter weapons for the 5v5 seems to be more agile. The longer it is, the more of a the more likely you are to get caught up or just not have a decent shot. Whereas if you've got one of those long boys when you've got the 13, the 12s or the 30s, then you can just bring the shots down again and again and again. And it's just that slow drum and that, that hammer to drive people back. Mm. So that's that's the good thing. That's the good of the two-handers. And then we get into other things I've seen pick up a bit more traction recently, but I'm not a massive fan of, is the two-handed falchion. Well, it had traction, and then they reduced its maximum weight, and then they disappeared from the sport. Mm. And suddenly, a load of new people who aren't aware that they used to be good and then became not very good joined mm. the sport and thought, man, those look cool. I want to look like someone from the Machowski Bible. Um, and then they just buy these things, which are of mixed use. It, legitimately, they do look cool. <laughs> but, like 200 cleaver. Mm. <laughs> but again, it's weighing up pros versus cons. What does it do yeah. that a two-handed axe doesn't when it loses a lot well, of the one of the, of the One of the axe. advantage of a two-handed axe is you can swing your hands down that whole length. So you mm-hmm. can bring that speed in with the whip, but you've got a small handle for that. So it's broadly speaking fixed body mechanics. Uh, I mean, in my personal opinion, uh, I believe that these weapons, aside from the fact that obviously 
in in reality, you can hold uh, a sword blade in your hand outside of the sport. So they have applications which we can't use because we are holding blade oh, edges. Set. Yeah, the rule set limits it. Um, you also see them on cavalry a lot. You do see them on foot, but they are on cavalry a lot. Mm. Um, so I have a sneaking suspicion that they may have had a specific battlefield role, which is not foot combat in an arena. Uh, I, I don't really think they're designed for what we do in any way, shape, or form. No. In fairness, if you're swinging one of those with a parrot and weight of a horse behind you against someone whose armour is less than brilliant, and they're going to have a bad day. Mm. Yeah, so th the biggest advantage this thing has is it looks cool. Yeah. yeah. And again, moving on to being, I think, even less useful in Boa is the longsword. Again, you see it occasionally. Some people have managed to make a little niche for it, but I can't remember the last time I saw a longsword in a bowhurt fight. Adrian like, Wade. Yeah. I love, I love yeah. longsword jewels, but bowhurt, nah, mate. There is a uh, Russian gentleman whose name I unfortunately can't remember right now. Um, no, I'm just his nickname. Uh, he doesn't like that nickname, as far as I'm aware, so I wasn't going to use it. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and, and Adrian. Um, now, they actually use different kinds of longswords as well, which is quite interesting. Uh, the Russian chap uses a maximum length longsword for maximum angle of moment and point impact. Uh, and I think Adrian uses a more conventional one. Um, Doesn't Adrian yeah. have like a little flare on the end of it as well? Um, Is there like a little leaf on the end of it? it uh, on the tip? Yeah. Um, if it does, I didn't notice it the last time it was pointed at me. That that's the thing when when I've seen him use it, it tends to get pointed at the eyes a lot just to discourage you. And that's yeah, yeah. Well, he holds a historical stance. Mm -hmm. He holds an actual sword guard, which for defense is fine. Yeah. I'm I'm not gonna presume it's for any reason other than historical fencing, which is fine because I mean it's just a shield bath, isn't it? Just don't run into it. Yeah. But yeah, there's there's not much use for that, I think. Yeah, long and short of it there is long swords not too great for bow hurt. So to move on from there is there's another part of your kit that doesn't get as much thought, I think, because it's not as cool as sh shiny, sh shiny swords, is uh, are shields. But they're just as important, and you really do realise if you haven't got a good one. My, my first one was a homemade one that just came apart, and I won't be doing that again, let's say. Yeah. So... Uh, First one, punch shields. Can you guys all see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so this is, I think, is the atypical punch shield. This one's a Primus one made by uh, JP. And I, I think this is just the apex of what we should be using, really. Yeah. Um, flat strike edge, lever on the edge. Mm -hmm. Got to have a curve to it. Uh, AC-wise, what, what are the bugbears of, with uh, shields at the moment? No protruding metal. Uh yeah. Finishing making properly, sure basically. it's so and yeah. So it, it's the finishing more than anything else. Uh, and there's also a caveat for weight. But if you've got a, a shield that's over five kilos, then there's a there's something else going on. Quite frankly. Well, if you have a five kilo metal shield, you are welcome to use it. But uh, yeah, I mean, good luck getting that brick moving. But you will possibly kill someone. So I mean, <laughs> but yeah. So JP shield here is a really good example of a well finished shield so the, it's stitched at the end it's not nailed in or bolted or god knows what else like you can barely see the like the rivets that are currently holding the strap handles on the other side when you turn that shield round or several of the shields when you turn that shield round there is the buckles in place it's riveted well there's no need to paint it or cover it either that like it's boarded it's scored it's covered it's a good shield the problems you tend to get are either the edges get really messy so the edge will be quite Broken, splintered, the leather's damaged. Yeah, the I don't around the edge has fallen off. Fallen off, sorry, fall for my God. Um, there's chunks, great coach bolts sticking out the other side with inches left on the thread. There's like uh, all sorts of like, uh, chunks of dog collar being used as straps. Now, for me, like me, what all of us, this is the one describing here is uh, broadly speaking our first shields in the sport. Because that's what they look like at the time, whereas everything is moved on quite quite significantly. And for Western kit, at least that shield right there, that's the style and the um, design you're going for. There's evidence of punch shields being used in our um, in the chunk of the area we're doing for, and there's always going to be the counter argument to 100% authentic with a great sliding heater shield, and then the practicalities of the sport we're doing. Mm. And the practicalities of the sport we're doing lead to this for the Western kit. 
So um, I, I like these punch shields. I like pretty big shields to get a lot of range. Like you see the punch shield behind mm. me was massive. It was always a kite shield. People didn't like that. But um, Steph, have you had experience with, because um, you said earlier when we were a lot smaller, have you had to go for particular sizes of shields different to that? Um, I mean, I've, I've always gone for punch shields myself as well. Obviously, um, it will make... Uh, quite a significant difference of how like you say how far, how much reach you'll end up having on it hmm. um i have had a custom made well, custom made one a mate of mine made one um, which had a long reach on it but um the buckles on your forearm uh, weren't tight enough so it just ended up flopping you go to punch someone and it just flop and that is useless um like yeah you'd have to land it just right for it not to do that um so in that sense you know maybe you'd have to draw it back a little bit you can i think punch shields are great from the point of view of obviously shields you can defend yourself they're they're fairly lightweight so you can move about nice and easy with them but then you've still got quite a big area that you're defending yourself with and it's like a secondary weapon with punching obviously yeah um so essentially you can be a bit like a boxer you strike do, do, and just keep on hitting people, which is fantastic to wear them down. Um, but yeah, you, you just want to, you want to watch probably pell work or something, um, decide what distance from where it's fixed on your arm to the reach end, like how big you want that. It's much like swords, <laughs> it's try before you buy. Like, yeah. yeah. Play around yeah. with other people, see what does and doesn't feel right to you. I don't know anyone on any team that wouldn't let someone borrow a shield or indeed their sword, even their favourite sword, just for a play about on the pelt to see how things work and why. So you've yeah. got a better informed decision at the end of the day. So with the different types of shields you can get, I think the biggest, uh, the other variation of a punch shield that we come across most is this, the pervase type. Yeah, uh, mm. yeah they put the, the 15th century pervase yeah, minimised to a single-handed, yeah. Which does so, exist, by the way. There are examples of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I struggle to see what advantage you get off of this than a normal, I call it a normal punch shield. It just feels yeah. like having that curve in there just gives something for weapons to bite into. There and is, surely that curve will just get in the way of your own arm. There is one potential advantage, which is alignment. So when you have a shield on the back of your hand, yeah. the, the edge is up here. If you so you're punching above your knuckle. Hmm. If you have a pervise which is spaced sufficiently, you are punching in line with your knuckle. Okay, now yeah. that is a potential advantage. I don't think it outweighs any no oh, advantage it gives you. But I personally okay. don't like pervise shields. I'm just trying to argue in their favour to some degree. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, I think, it's, I think it's an aesthetic thing a lot of the time. I think you've nailed it on the head though with the um, that smaller curve gives. Uh, something one weapons to bite into and two uh, imagine repairing that can't this is it so normal shields they're not ridiculously expensive to maintain and to buy so like, that's a lot of extra work that's going on. there's two ways of making it you either bend the wood which would be bend the shop of that isn't happening or you layer up plywood and then you carve them out top and bottom it's a lot of extra time it's a lot of extra effort so it's something that Okay. My negative, like negligible, my benefit. Mm. Uh, so, uh, another variation of shield you sometimes seen. I appreciate now, looking at the scale of those uh, rivets, that this is a buckler, but they're meant to represent a round shield. You don't see them much anymore. But some people go for them. For Eastern kit. Sometimes. I've seen them kicking about for Eastern kit. Round and oval shields for Eastern kit. I've seen them still kicking about. Mm -hmm. Broadly speaking, though, the only round shields, regardless of size, I've seen re like oh, it's common is the one handed bucklers and two metal straps and a yeah. piece of round wood in the off hand of whoever's wielding a two handed weapon. Yeah, so again, I don't think a round shield gives you anything that a punch shield doesn't. Uh, and then. You'd avoid that, Terry, don't you? I was just going to say, you do see it occasionally in other categories, namely mm. pro fighting. It appears yeah. quite a bit. Yes, yes. Sorry, like outside of the Bova arena, yeah. Mm. Yeah, as you mentioned, bucklers there. Um, 
I don't mind having one, a spare one, in case someone's shield goes and you can just grab it quickly, go straight in your hand, fucking sorted. Um, Halberdiers having one to protect the knuckles. That's a good idea I've seen coming up a lot recently. And um, I think it's Mike from Lion Steel uses a massive type buckler type thing, doesn't he, that he straps onto his wrist. Yes. Like um, blanket. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He uses yeah. a big old dinner plate, yeah. Mm. Yeah. But um, again, I don't think it gives you much that a shield doesn't. Some people use that with a mace when they just want to be a brawler. You have to look at the, um, the type of armor you have to wear to couple with that shield for it to work. That wooden shield you can wear through, if not all of the kit, minus the very late end plates up at the far end of this period. Whereas the metal shields, even the small bucklers, but especially the large ones that they might use, you have to wear full curious ass with that, um, full plate, full stop. Um, but yeah, so the expense on two fronts. One, yeah, it's a nice large shiny shield. Two, the cost of the armor to, to, smith, to meet that is um, substantial. Well, as someone that used one in Bahur for a length of time, for nearly half a year, I can I, I can comment quite extensively on them because um, I owned one for a very long time, yeah. uh, and which was metal handle and a wrist fixate on the gauntlet. So around mm. the around the hourglass, you've got a leather strap which stabilizes it on the gauntlet and you've got it in the handle, which means that no matter what, you can open your hand and it stays on your hand. It's an ex It becomes an extension of the gauntlet at that point. For defense, it, it does mean that you have a certain degree of deflection, um, but yes, your arm is more vulnerable. Uh, the main advantage I found was it gives you a superior grappling ability uh, just through the fact that you can flex your wrist. So because you can pivot your wrist, you can actually get bows on the back of the neck a lot more readily instead of having to get your whole arm round. He just gives you wrist control because your wrist can flex. Uh, you have shorter range punches. You have different types of punches that you can use. Mm. Um, you have better opportunity to control opponent's weapons. You have an easier time. You are less likely to find that your opponent pins your shield as well. Because mm. um, if you've ever gotten stuck because someone's looped their arm around your forearm to stop you from getting your arm out with a buckler, it's not such a big deal. Um, and also, the one thing I will say is there's no better feeling in the world than finding a uh, a brig fastening gap and rimming it with a steel buckler. That that is there's a special place in my heart for that feeling. Um, <laughs> but genuinely, they have a valid place. It's just they have a high skill ceiling. Again, it, it's this concept of, oh, a shield, it's easier to defend yourself. Yes, it has offensive abilities. Yes, it has various traits. Buckler, harder to defend yourself. But if your skill ceiling is higher, you still can adequately. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives you a few more tools in your toolbox for techniques and options. Um, and it, But it does reduce your effective range on punches if you have a longer punching shield, for example. But it, it's just a higher skill item. Uh, and if you look in old fighting manuals, that's reflected by... The idea that, oh, you should train sword and buckler all the time, even though you're not going to ever use it, purely because it will make you better with other things, um, just because it's harder to use. I think something um, hinted at there by Anthony, which is a really good point to be raised, is how you can adapt your armor around the shield you have. So if you've got a small buckler, you're broadly speaking still wearing the same kit as you would be normally. Whereas if you've got a decent heat shield, sorry, a decent punch pipe shield, the like type we've just shown. I, I do know of some people who don't wear any form of forearm protection. They, mm -hmm. they shed that weight. I know people who, and quite a few people, and I'm looking to hit them on myself, wear a shield gauntlet. So instead of the full weight and encumbrance of the gauntlet, they've got like three plates that cover the thumb and the knuckles and the back of the wrist. That's it. And you can shed weight that way. Um, so it's, it's worth, and the shield itself, again, you can flex the weight. So the one you showed there had got a plate down the center, which was steel a plate at the end or a cut at the end, basically. So when you strike, you're hitting steel with steel, uh, which elongates the life of the shield significantly. Well, if you start taking those things out, the shield becomes much lighter. So if you're looking at absolutely dropping the weight of your kit for whatever reason, you can have a light but strong shield, but you might need to replace it more regularly. And on top of that, you can also then lighten the armor you're wearing behind that because of protection that plank provides. But as Anthony Adafi puts it, it does also become an encumbrance that large plank is hard to move around when someone's got their arm around yours, and it's easier to flex the pull and to lever against you. 
it, it, I will also reiterate that it is legitimately within the rules to remove a shield. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, shield is uh, armor. You can rip properly, those yeah. off. Yeah, a properly strapped buckler is almost impossible to remove. Um, purely because once it's fitted to the gauntlet, it's it's basically your gauntlet now has a shield on it, attached to it, and it's not going to come off until you undo the strap and then get the knuckle out. Um, although no, I've lost shields, I've lost I... straps on my old shields. Not my new JP shields. I hate them to add, but on some of my old shields. Like I have lost straps where people have wrenched and it's just pulled it away. It if is, I it's, it it it's, it's, it's consumable. <laughs> yeah, this is it. Mm. Right, so that's everything I had lined up there, guys. But um, are there any other bits of kit or points that you'd like to put out to the people out there? Don't go looking in historical manuals uh, for random weapons to be cool. <laughs> yeah. Shall we do that one? Yeah. Because yeah, if you look hard yeah, enough, you can uh, find war sides and everything. There are all sorts of absolutely stunning pieces of kit. There's a um, one that I've always loved. It's like a, a half and half. So half top half of it is a cleaver with all sorts of can opening operators like and spikes and flukes sat around it. And the bottom half is just a long piece of wood with a great steel spike at the end of it. And it's always shown this manuscript of this man laying waste all before him. Oh, it looks stunning. Uh, absolutely no use in this poor whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, the, best, the best way to work out what works is to look at the best teams in the world, watch them fly. What are they using? There will be a reason behind what they're using and how they're using it. And if you've not got that in your lo like the skills or the, uh, the knowledge in your local area, which you might not have, then that's a really good place to start. Start watching those pro fights, those top-end like uh, fixtures, and go, okay, well, they're using this kit. There's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Unique isn't necessarily useful, and in many no. ways, it's always better to keep it simple, stupid. Remember, these are tools, consumable tools. At the end of the day, they're going to get dent, dented, bent, and broken. Mm. You don't need heavily engraved artistic beauties. Yeah. It's a tool. Yeah, I mean, who would buy an engraved sword for money? Yeah. Yes, who would do that? Uh, yeah, that, that, that is... <laughs> we're all guilty of this. It, it, it is actually a really no, valid I'm point. <laughs> as well like when you are starting there is literally no harm in buying a jiri krondak 1.4 kilo falchion just to no. just to start out for what and 80 euros yeah. comparative this is it it's not an expensive option you can get axes for 50 quid and maces sorry uh falchions for 80 and um, like i can't yeah. see what the postage is going to be it's going to vary but like these are relatively cheap options yeah. Once you've got used to pell work, once you know what you're doing, or what a rough idea of it, then look at getting yourself a box by the fashion. And worst case scenario, when you progress from that, sell it on to someone else or keep it as a spare. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, for me personally, every single time I see someone join the spot and go, ah, oh, I have purchased uh, yeah. a, a sword. Five grand of equipment I've purchased, which we can't ever use. Yeah, a really. sword brand. Yeah. <laughs> sword brands or pole mm. hammers. Or some other junk that they'll use once and then find that they can't lift. And then yeah. I have blunted yeah. this machete. May I use it? Yeah. No, no mate. <laughs> no. Please, yeah. please stop. Blow um, I've got some welded rebar. Talk to the community, mm -hmm. like whoever's in your local area or like whoever you know, however you got into this sport, just like to talk around to the community. Um, everyone is really happy to pass you on to someone else who knows if they don't know that sort of thing yeah. and like Piers was saying earlier um almost everyone will be happy for you to hold their weapon to just have a go on the pel see how you feel about it so do mm -hmm. do, do the long work don't go for shiny beautiful expensive useless <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. The important thing you came up with there is someone in the community will always be willing to help because nothing yeah. makes my day like someone wanted to talk about Bo Hurt. Uh, <laughs> is, is all I've got. It's all I've got left. <laughs> most nations want to come have got their own national pages. Yeah. So most nations have got their own national pages. I know the UK does, and I know it's very active. And if anyone goes, look, I'm new to this sport. I'm from this area. The first thing they do is, all right, your closest clubs are these guys. And then you can start talking to them. But the worst case scenario is like, I don't, I want to join. I don't know how, what I need to do, talk to them. Don't spend any money until you've spoken to them. So you've gone to a few training sessions. You've worked out what's what and why. 
Like, there's no need to spend money in, in this can be a bloody expensive sport, but it doesn't need to be as expensive as some people make it. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, obviously, I, I believe you've spoken about helmets before, and you'll probably talk about actual armor choices another time, but mm-hmm. people really do seem to like to rush into buying what they think that will be good for them without actually considering what will work for them. So, I mean, yeah, weapons, it always happens. Yeah, I, 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 everyone wants to use a halberd because it's, it's yes. cool. Everybody wants to be the one-hit kill man that carries the team. Yes. And that said, like, there's nothing to stop you from having more than one piece of kit later. I think me and my friend Armstrong, we've got enough pieces of kit between the two of us to arm a 12 team. Oh, God. My, my missus exactly. getting thread as a weapon's turning up at my house. There we go. How many bits of shiny kit do we have? I mean, in the UK, it was because we're spoiled by the um, people we have here. So Joe Dawes, as we've mentioned before, has made a thousand for every single person on this call, at least. I have several acts with him. I have those Gundargans, which are those um, like good morning clubs or good day clubs from the Dutch Netherlands and the uh, ethnic cleansing there. Um, can't use them for sport, never should. But yeah, we've got a man who will happily make whatever it is you fancy and a few things other than besides. So we're spoiled, whereas a good few people on the continent don't have access to that. And so they do have the medieval extreme, like cheap, cheerful, just get them out by the dozen. But yeah, like if get one of those first, have a seat, have a feel, play around with everyone else's, and then after that, if you want to get yourself a nice piece of shiny kit, you can do that, but don't rush into it. Mm. This is why I said at the beginning, the, f- the first thing you should mm. buy are training weapons, because like, yeah. I've had whole teams go onto the field, and I've looked at it and gone, those are all my weapons. <laughs> there, yeah. there are enough spare weapons <laughs> wherever yeah. you are, for you to play with a variety of them, and find out what's right for you. One thing I do distinctly remember from uh, Italy, the Battle of Nations in Rome, is when the English team showed up, they showed up with two wheelbarrows, literal wheelbarrows, filled with weapons. And the other nations of the team looked at us and said, what is that? Some of the team's weapons. What do you mean some of the team's weapons? It's like, well, we've got more. They're coming out the van after we've checked these ones. <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> quite eclectic bunch. Yeah. <laughs> we've got an awful habit of picking up shiny things. It's a, it's a bit of an obsession at times but yeah mm. i think that's everything i was hoping to cover here and hopefully those of you listening have picked up on some good stuff and thank you guys very much for coming on the show today and giving me your opinions uh of keep online because in a couple of days we'll be speaking with anthony about the state of the uk and a few other things besides thank you all very much for being on and we'll speak to you again soon cheers bye bye Drop.